with us. So glad that you can participate with us this morning. I trust you enjoyed the communion time. I trust as the men prayed, you too were praying for our country because there are so many things that we need to be praying for. And Paul said, let it be of first order that you pray for the land and its leaders that you may be at peace. Amen. That we can work. And that's what we want to do. We want to work. We want to be involved and engaged in all the things that uh, we can do to see things moving forward. Well, we're in our summer series now. We wrapped up a series last week, and this week we'll find ourselves beginning once again in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 3 is where we're at. Last summer we did chapter 1 and 2. And let me just let you know that we're going to continue in that study over the summer whenever I'm in the saddle here. And we're going to revisit, revisit the early history of the church and here's how we're going to do it. I like what Mark Driscoll said years ago. He said, "You two people love history, scholars and soldiers. Scholars like to look back and see what was done, but soldiers study it for the sake of what remains to be done. So we're going to study like soldiers because the job isn't done yet. Isn't that true? And so as we come to study the history of the early church, we're not looking at just what God used to do, but what st God still wants to do. Amen? And uh, we are invited today to be part of the most important mission in the history of the world. A soldier marches forward so that people can have freedom and life. And we march forward together as the people of God so that people may receive freedom and eternal life. That is what we're after Today. So let me give you a little bit of background to the book of Acts. I think I spent a whole Sunday morning doing it last time. Let me give it to you in a few paragraphs today. Well, Luke wrote two books. I don't know if you know about that, but go to Luke chapter, do, go to rather to Acts chapter 3, but I'm going to talk about Luke for just a minute. Luke wrote two books for us, and here's what he wrote in his first volume, which we call the Gospel of St. Luke. Here's what he said, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things that were accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those from whom in the beginning were eyewitnesses of the servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most the excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you've been taught. Now I want you to notice just a couple of phrases there. It seemed fitting for me having investigated everything from the beginning. In other words, here's what Luke's telling you. Luke is telling us that as a first century believer, he's gone back to the eyewitnesses of the events in the life of Jesus and his gospel and verified all of those events and he's gonna do the same thing in Acts as they've been disclosed to him by the people who were on the spot, who had seen what was going on at the time. So Luke has gone back to carefully verify. Here's the second thing that he says, so that you may know the exact truth. In other words, I went back and I just didn't hear the stories. I verified what was there. I went to others and said, you were there that day. Tell me what happened. And so what we get in Luke and Acts is Luke the fastidious historian starting from a human perspective and uh, a meticulous man who has written carefully and then you add to the mix that he's inspired by the Holy Spirit sets off to write an orderly account of events. Why does he do that? Well, because the first generation is passing. The first generation of those who had walked with Jesus and seen all that he's done are passing off the scene. By the time he sits down to pen the words that are in Luke and Acts, it's about between 60 and 70 AD, just before the fall of Jerusalem. And the second generation is coming up behind and they've heard but not seen. And so he gets paper, up, paper and pen and this Theophilus character says, is it true what they're telling me? And so Luke goes back to document carefully everything that has been told. Why? So that he could know the exact truth and have assurance. You see, there were prophecies in the Old Testament that came through the prophets, and others as eyewitnesses wrote those down back in the day, and those we have in the Old Testament. But even those prophecies 
They were very precise. But Luke is going to tell us Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Why does that matter? Well, because Isaiah said. He's going to tell us Jesus dies on a cross. Well, that's because... And all these things were prophesied. And what he wants you to know is that God was very precise about many of the details about Jesus' life and ministry. And then he goes further and says, but he didn't stop with the life of Jesus. The message goes on. The prophetic word is true. Let me show you how it gets confirmed after our crucified, and resurrected, and now risen Lord continues to see the message go forward. In fact, at the end of Luke's gospel, here's what he writes to us. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Notice the first three were four words. Thus it is written. In other words, I got this from the Old Testament. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Everywhere, he said. This should be an international message that goes out, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, Jesus said, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So that's how volume one ends. And volume two essentially begins with the arrival of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is promised in the book of Luke and comes through in the book of Acts. And so Acts is also an authentic, exacting, uh, precise record of history of the experiences of men and women inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. If you're going to trust anybody, go see Dr. Luke. Because he's going to give it to you straight up. The way that he researched it and found it out. Here's what he said. Here's what, here's what we know about Jesus. Jesus said these words, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The mission had not been completed when Jesus ascended. He had handed it off to the 12, who in turn were going to hand it off to others. And that comes to you and me. And to this hour, your Lord says these words, I will build my church. But how was he going to do that? Well, friends, the hour of the Lord Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit is still engaged in this hour, adding people to the list of the redeemed. He's fulfilling the Father's plan by through the preaching of the gospel in the power of the Spirit. Make no mistake, it is the Lord continuing the redemptive work he began among humankind. And so in Acts chapter 3, where we get started this morning, is the record of the first miracle that happens in the book of Acts after the day of Pentecost. And so this miracle is more than a miracle. It shows us two things, because Luke wants us to know two things. Let's find out what those two things are. In Acts chapter 3, the miracle is a sign of two things. Number one, that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive and well after his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus has unleashed the power of the Holy Spirit as he promised on the people who chose to repent, be baptized, and follow him. Ephesians calls these people, these spirit-filled followers of Jesus, now scattered around the globe, the body of Christ. And Luke wants you to know that Christ is still at work. He may be in heaven, but he is working through those whom he has left behind and those who will follow after. The second thing he wants you to know is that Jesus is now working to complete the mission through his followers. Not only is Jesus' name going to be invoked here, but the followers as well are going to pull their weight and do their part. So, God's at work today. He's not finished yet. The question that you have to answer as we walk into the book of Acts this summer is simply this one. Are you going to fully engage, give your life wholeheartedly as the men and women of Scripture will to the mission of God on planet Earth while you're here? And with that, let's pray and then get started. Father, we thank you for your word that offers light, life, and hope to us. Now as we look at your word and study a story, 
We ask that you will open our eyes and our ears to see what it is that you need us to see and to hear going forward in the 21st century. Amen. So, Luke, Acts chapter 3, the third chapter of the book of Acts, verse number 1. Let's get started there, shall we? One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, 3 in the afternoon. So after the events of Acts chapter 2, we're told in Acts 2.43, 2, many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And so Luke now pushes pause on giving us all the theology stuff and says, let me tell you a story that shows that that's exactly what was going on. So here's the first of many stories that he will tell us. And this one was probably a fairly popular one, repeated often. Why? Because it happened right at the beginning. Within just a few days of the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, this event takes place. And they are just the people, I'm sure the story went all around the town. Notice in verse 1 now that these apostles continued to live as faithful Jews attending the services of worship at the temple since they were still in Jerusalem. And you know that there was two of them daily. They have said two times of prayer every day. They, were, they ran uh, in, line, in alignment with the morning and the evening sacrifice. The morning sacrifice was at 9. The evening sacrifice was at 3 in the afternoon say three in the afternoon that's a tad early isn't it well they had to watch the fire and by the time you burn up the sacrifice well it takes a bit and if you've been to Israel you know that it gets dark almost every day between six and seven o'clock so by the time the sacrifice got yeah they needed a couple of hours so they started at three that's the evening sacrifice it's the same time that Elijah did his up on Mount Carmel around three o'clock in the afternoon you say, well, what's your observation, Pastor? Oh, let me tell you what it is. Sometimes good things happen when we simply do what authentic disciples are supposed to do. They're showing up at the temple. They're in Jerusalem. They're going to the time of prayer. That's what authentic disciples do. It's not what Hebrews 10, 25 that you know so well says. Some people, he writes, have given up the habit of meeting together. But we must not do that. We should keep on encouraging each other, especially since you know the day of the Lord's coming is getting closer. Friends, so often God is preparing things for you and I where he expects us to be. The stuff is right in front of you and he's lining it up because he knows where you should be. And when you and I don't show up when we're supposed to show up at our with our family, why did God promise to work in our family, on our place of work? He's promised to work with us when we get together as the family of God. That's when God works. And so God says, you show up when you're supposed to show up, and I'll show you what I got ready for you. And God has prepared things for us. Good things happen when you and I place ourselves in a place, in a position where God is prepared to work. Acts chapter 3 and verse 2. Now a man who was lame from birth, Luke continues, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Now this lame man who had no use of his legs, he's a paraplegic fellow, doesn't have any use of his legs. This is the day before wheelchairs. How does he get around? Well, he gets carried around. He's got friends. Thank God for friends. Amen. Who will carry you where you need to go. Get you where you... He had a personal taxi service. Absolutely marvelous. Anyway, this lame man who had no use of his legs gets placed at the entrance to the temple because although he's got friends who will help him get somewhere, yeah, they're all living in a cashless society too. And so, so he goes there to do what people with his infirmity do. They beg. We're still doing it on the streets of Toronto and downtown St. Catharines. I'm sure you've met them. It's still going on in the 21st century. But here's what it, they placed him there because it was probably the gate or the doorway where most of the people were going through. So what's your observation, Pastor? My observation is sometimes for God to use us, we must be sensitive to the nudge of the Holy Spirit and be willing to have our day interrupted. Sometimes I get so busy doing the things that I have to do, I'm on my way and I'm just beelining it because I have to this and then this and then this and then this. What if God's got an interruption for me? Now, if Peter, if, if Peter and John were anything like 
Many people I know, there's a struggle to get to church in a rather timely manner. How many of you would guess that Peter and John were likely hustling just a bit? I think so too. I think they were in a bit of a hurry. They were going to be late for the prayer circle down in Solomon's Colonnade. What are you going to do? And the guy says, do you have anything to spare? <laughs> well, they were willing to be interrupted in their day. And in order for God to use us, we must be sensitive to the nudge of the Spirit too. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 4, And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave him them his attention, expecting to receive from them. Peter said, Look at us, because likely as soon as he had finished asking, he was looking around them to see his next victim. I mean, to see his next opportunity. I mean, if these two are going to give, it's great, but he's already looking around your legs to see the next one. Peter says, Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at us. So what's your observation? Sometimes for God to use us, we must slow down and give others our full attention and then ask for their. Then ask for theirs. Because I notice that sometimes when people ask me for their full attention, they're holding a cell phone. You know how much of my... I, gave the, I put mine down and looked up at them and they didn't put theirs down. They just keep talking. Put your cell phone down, sweetie, and look at you. If you want to talk to me, talk to me, not to the box. Ask people for their attention. It's polite. It's not evil. I hear the frustration in the crowd. Some of you have had this experience before. We not only have to be sensitive to the nudge of the Spirit, but we've got to slow down enough to give others our full attention and then ask for theirs, Acts chapter 3, then verse 6. And then Peter said, here's the song I learned as a child, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And taking him by the hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Here's what I noticed, that for God to use me, I must be prepared to offer what I have. Silver and gold have I none, Peter said. I, I, there's nothing in my pockets today. But I have some. Do you know that you have something when your pockets are empty? Do you have something when your pockets are empty? That's the question. In fact, if there's one big takeaway from today, this would be one of them. What have you got when your pockets are empty? Well, we find out that Peter had a gift of healing and miracles, and he got the nudge from the Spirit. How do you know it was the Holy Spirit? Well, because probably Jesus walked by this guy when he went to the temple too. And how many times have Peter and John been to the temple? They were there, steady, when they were back in Jerusalem. They were meeting there daily in the temple. They walked by this guy how many times? But today is his day. Today is the day when the Spirit of God gives you the nudge that it's time to talk to your co-worker. It's time to talk to your daughter. It's time to speak with your son. It's time to talk to your dad. Whatever it is. But for God to use me, I must be prepared to offer what I have. What do you have? You have what Peter had. You have Jesus. You have the privilege of prayer. You have Bible knowledge and understanding. You have a testimony. What has God done for you? What has he done for you in saving you? And what has he done for you lately? You have a story to share. Plus whatever gifts, talents, and abilities. How many folks do I know that have been interrupted in the midst of something because somebody needed some help and they were capable? I mean, if you've got car trouble, don't ask me. Okay, I do exactly what you do. I walk around the car kick the tires, open the hood, rattle everything that I can see, then lay on, lay my hands on and say, Dear Jesus, help! Because that's what I know about auto mechanics. Okay, so don't ask me to help you with the car. But there are things. And there are people that help with cars, because I've had car trouble before. And some kind saint of God or other individual has come along and used their talent to bless me. What do you have when your pockets are empty? That's a question you need to answer. You've got gifts, spiritual, natural, 
The Holy Spirit has empowered you. In fact, I know you've got gifts because Ephesians tells me that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says, But to each one of us, grace, that's power, has been given as Christ. This is Jesus now, apportioned it. That's why it says when he ascended on high, that was Acts chapter 1, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. You've got a gift. The Bible says you've been given a gift. If you don't know what it is, then you better find out. Peter, found, Peter knew that he had a gift of healing and miracles, and he used it that day. Acts chapter 3, now in verse 8, says, He jumped to his feet and began to walk, walking and leaping and praising God. Isn't that the chorus we sang when I was a kid? Oh, it is. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking, jumping, praising God. When all the people saw him, Walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. When Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk, he was invoking the power, the presence, and the authority of Jesus. Do you know that Jesus? This isn't the Jesus whom Paul preaches. This is the one you better know. And if you know that Jesus then amazing, wonderful, marvelous things can happen when you respond to the leading of that same Holy Spirit and to have that authority of Jesus' name. The lame beggar, by faith, is walking, standing, dancing in the authority of Jesus' name. Acts chapter 3, while the men held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colony. That's where they were at that moment. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if our, by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Here's my fifth observation for the morning. For God to use me, I have to change the focal point from myself to my Jesus. Peter immediately shifts it. Who was the instrument of God's healing? Peter. Peter. But Peter knows enough to know that his gifts, talents, and abilities have come from elsewhere. He may have honed them. He may have developed them. But those gifts and talents were not were given to him. They were gifts that he received. And so he immediately changes the focal point from himself to Jesus. These men that are gathering around them are devout Jews. They're at a prayer meeting. I know it's tough to get people out to prayer meeting. I run them too. So I know who was at the temple that day. The devout Jews were at the temple. The people who were fully committed to God. The people who were seeking His presence and purposes. They were there that day. And Peter turns around and begins to communicate with them. While this man lame from birth that they all recognize is walking and leaping and praising God. So Peter quickly gets the attention off himself and his followers of Christ. We must realize when great things happen, God is at work through us. It isn't by our power, but Christ's power. Peter continues, Acts chapter 3 and verse 13. Here's what he says. The God of Abraham, Isaac, the God of Jacob, our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. There he comes up again, this Jesus character. You handed him over. Boy, this turns fast, doesn't it? You handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. Pilate was going to let Jesus off. You remember that part? Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Send him home. But the Jews kept pushing. You disown, Peter said, the holy and righteous one, the one separated for the purposes of God, and asked that a murderer be released to you. you. Remember that? What was his name? Anybody know? Barabbas. That's what it was. Verse 16, by faith, you, verse 15 rather, you killed the author of life. John chapter 1. In him was... He is the source of all life for all of us. Not only physical, but spiritual. 
Peter tells the crowd, you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. Everybody's head shot up. Peter says, and we are witnesses of this. It took two witnesses. Can you see John's head bobbing behind him? I mean, Peter's always the one doing the talking. Isn't that how it usually works? I know that in my family, there's always one of us that's talking and the other one's behind with the head bobbing. Yep, that's what John's doing. That's his job. His job is confirmation and affirmation. You can't always pick who you're with, but man, affirm what they're saying if, if it's true. Amen? And John can affirm. Verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is by Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. I want you to underline that in your Bible. It says perfectly healed him. What got fixed for that man? Man, I, I, I like this miracle better every time I read it. He is made completely whole. God just didn't put him back on his feet. He fixed everything. This was a complete overhaul. This was a complete makeover. When Peter said, rise and be healed, he didn't just say, the he didn't say, let your legs be healed so you can get up and move. He said, rise and be from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. God transformed this man. He said, he is completely whole. Wow. Can your Jesus do that? Mine can. I often forget. But let me tell you, it's right there. How does that happen? Verse 16, by faith in the name of Jesus. Mm, what's my observation on this one? Let me just see if I can find it. There it is. Change the focal point from their self-righteousness and remind them of their guilt and their need. These are good devout Jews. These are good folks. These are not troublemakers. And yet Peter turns them back and says, listen, folks, you need what he came to supply. Peter says, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. See, this is the man that made this man strong, and that fits for us too, because the people we're walking with and talking with need to recognize that it's their sins just like our sins. My sins nailed him to that tree. <laughs> but I'm not the only one guilty here. We've all done it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and no honest person would say it otherwise. But Christ was put on the cross, but because of his resurrection, that we can testify to because we've experienced his power in our lives to forgive, reconcile, and restore. How did we, re we do it? The same as this man. This layman got it by faith, by faith in the name of Jesus. If you're watching me this morning or listening within the sound of my voice in this room, it is by faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. That's how it's all going to happen because God can do stuff that we can't do. He's God, we're not, and He's ready to step in. Amen. In some of our circumstances on some days, I don't know how many times these folks walk past this layman, but this was his day. This was his day. Maybe this is your day. Maybe this is your family member's day. Maybe this is your friend's day. Maybe this week is your week because you need employment. Maybe this week is your week for the finances to begin to spin around. If this is your day, will you take hold of it? Or are you going to be like the lame guy looking around trying to see if he can get another dime from somebody? In Jesus' name. By faith in the name of Jesus there is transformation possible and available. Acts chapter 3, verse 17, Peter continues, Now, fellow Israelites, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying the Messiah would suffer. Repent then, and turn to God, that your sins may be wiped out, and the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. For heaven has received him until the time comes for God to restore everything. Did you see what God's going to do someday? He's going to restore everything. As he promised long ago through the holy prophets, when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked 
ways at verse 26. Mm. Peter preaches to the crowd and then he turns their attention from their separation from God to the possibility of reconciliation with God. Verse 19 and 20 are the key to everything that I believe. Maybe for you too. Here's what he said. Repent then. There it is. What does repentance mean? It means turning from going the direction I'm going to going God's way. If I'm going to walk with God, I have to go the direction God is going. God will walk with me, but only if I walk with him. God doesn't walk with me when I go my way. I'm on my own. Are you on your own this morning? The Bible says repent and turn towards God so that your sins can be wiped out. The times of refreshing come from the Lord. Do you need refreshing, renewing, restoring today? Then that, in fact, is the job of of God if you and I will do our part and turn and repent people must repent and trust in the saving power of Christ he is the one that refreshes he is the one that's returning for us he is the one that we will spend eternity with this morning in communion we read do this until he comes he's not come yet that's why we're still at this table. That means the mission's not done. That means this is your and my opportunity. We, we can still be in this hour in the 21st century fully engaged in the mission of Jesus Christ. You say, what do I have to offer? That's what I want to know. Peter said, silver and gold, I have none. Some of you are in his shoes. But such as I have. So what else do you have? Your Lord has given you gifts, talents, abilities, time, and opportunity. What will you do with what you've been given? So what have we learned? We've learned that we are his instruments like Peter and John. We are his emissaries, his representatives sent on mission. We are his ambassadors, his authorized messengers. We are witnesses, men and women, young and old, who must be prepared to share his story as Peter was, and to share our story of what Christ has done. Paul would write later in 2 Corinthians, here's what he wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you've believed on Jesus, he's a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, but he doesn't stop there. He starts to outline where it goes from there. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Thank you very much. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has, here he says it a second time. Did you see that? He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's your job. That's my job. That's our opportunity and our task. We are Christ's ambassadors conveying the message of our Lord to our world. God is making his appeal through us. Here's the message. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. You see, friends, our missionary God is not waiting for you and me. He's already out in work like with Peter and John. He was out in front of them getting everything set up. And the exciting news is that he invites us to join in his mission of reconciliation. The current reality of our world in this pandemic is certainly a motivation for all that we have to do every day as Christ's ambassadors, calling to those who will listen, who will give us their attention, and we will give them ours. We'll slow down. We'll take an interruption in the day. And at the end of the conversation or somewhere in between as the Holy Spirit leads, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Here's what I know. God's right in the middle of the greatest rescue mission ever. And he's inviting us to join him. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we are so grateful for your word. Grateful for your love and the work of your Holy Spirit among us. Lord, as we get about the normal stuff of our Christian life, going to church and out with the family, doing things on the job, 
to having leisure time at summer now, Lord. I know you know that. But Lord, in all of those situations, we put ourselves in a place of availability for service to you. God, today we tell you again that we're willing to be interrupted for one of your divine appointments. Holy Spirit, help us in those moments to slow down, to listen, to put others' needs first, to ask for their attention. Holy Spirit, when we do, would you work? When we offer what we have by way of testimony or the gospel or gifts, talents, and abilities, Lord, would you work? Help us to turn their attention from us to our Lord who has given us these abilities and empowered us to be gracious in this hour. Lord, lead them to yourself. Help us to be empowered to speak your words that men and women could be reconciled and received. You said you would not cast anyone out who would receive you. If they would come, you would take them. So, Lord, we ask that you would open doors before us in the week that lies ahead. We rely on you, Jesus, in the power of your name. We look to you, O oh God, for blessings. We ask all this now in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen.